Spammer is no handicap. It is a mode of speech. Stammer is the silence that falls between the word and its meaning. Just as lameness is the silence that falls between the word and the deed. Did stammer precede language or succeed it? Is it only a dialect or a language itself? These questions make the linguist stammer. Each time we stammer, we are offering a sacrifice to the God of meanings. When a whole people stammer, stammer becomes their mother tongue, just as it is with us now. God too must have stammered when he created man. That's why all the words of man carry different meanings. That's why everything he utters, from his prayers to his commands, stammers like poetry. K. Satchidanandan is a leading Indian poet writing in Malayalam and English. He is known as a pioneer of modern poetry in Malayalam. He is also a critic, columnist, translator and the former secretary of the Kindra Sahitya Akadmi, a torchbearer of the socio-cultural revolution that redefined Malayalam literature in the 1970s and 80s, Satchidanandan has always advocated the rights of the oppressed, minorities, marginalized castes and classes and women. Satchidanandan has to his credit 60 books in Malayalam, including 21 poetry collections and an equal number of translations of poetry, as well as plays, essays and travelogues and four critical works in English. The poem Stammer was originally written in Malayalam by Satchidanandan with the title Vikku and was translated by the poet himself into English. Our students had an exclusive interview with Satchidanandan on Stammer and his perspective on contemporary socio-political scenario. Let's watch that exclusive interview with Satchidanandan. Hello everyone. We are the students and teachers of Government Model High Secondary School, Pirindamanna in Malapuram district. We are very grateful and blessed to have a talk with the noted Indian poet and critic Satyadanandan sir. A very warm welcome sir. Let me ask you a first question. What inspired you to write the poem Stammer? Stammer is a poem I wrote originally in Malayalam under the title Vikku in 2002. Of course, uh, it was provoked in some sense by my own inability to articulate what I wanted to articulate. You know, a poet often feels helpless in front of the blank page because he has a lot to express, but he may often not have the words to express all the complex emotions and thoughts that he has at that particular moment. And that's why often you find ancient poets beginning with a prayer to God or to the God of uh, knowledge or the Goddess of knowledge, asking him or asking her to provide words like the oceans of the waves as Eltachan the famous uh, poet of Ramayana in Kerala did. So, ultimately, this very dilemma, this ex extreme difficulty to express oneself becomes the subject of a poem 
and that's what happens in a poem like uh, Stammer. The incompleteness of language, the gap between feeling and expression, between thought and communication, between the real world and the world of poetry. It is in this gap that this particular poem has been born and it, and it is trying to express all the difficulties, all the questions that this great vacuum raises before human beings. It is my own incapacity to express myself completely. And I feel that language often stammers and we are unable to express ourselves entirely as we really want it through language. And so uh, there, there, a shadow seems to fall between our thought and our expression, our feeling and our articulation, or between the heart and the paper, or the brain and the and the vacant paper in front of us. And Stammer tries to articulate that moment of doubt and of uh, dilemma. Okay, thank you, sir. So it is said in the poem that everything a man utters from his prayers to his command stammers like poetry. Why did you compare these two modes of utterances? Yes, I think that's a very intelligent question. Prayers and commands. Because actually these are two extreme forms of expression. A prayer is a very humble, a polite request to God to any God that you believe in or to the universe at large to give you something. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very polite and humble request. While the command is an order, it just tells you what you have to do. Prayer asks God or the universe or the mystery that surrounds us uh, to give you something. It's, all, it's, 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 a, it's a, as I said, a very modest plea. While well, command is an order. So, uh, so I wanted to take these two extreme forms of expression that exist in the language. Prayer is the humblest form of expression and command is the uh, most arrogant form of expression uh, that exists in language. And that's why I wanted to say that from prayers to commands, that means every form of expression, there are many forms of expression that come in between them. All forms of expression are in some way affected by doubt. Even when we pray, we are not sure whether the prayer will be heard or whether there is somebody at all to hear your prayer. And when you give a command, you are not sure whether finally people are going to obey your command or not. So there is a stammer. Even when you give an order and there is a command, there is a, there is a stammer. Even when you pray or when you put forward a request. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, you wrote that stammer is the silence that falls between words and its meanings. How will you interpret this silence in this present political scenario? Yes, we are living in a time of uh, what what George Orwell called a double speak. You say something, but you often mean something else. Uh, uh, many of the political parties you find give us uh, many colorful promises, but ultimately, when it comes to reality, they go back. They do not often keep those promises. And you find that happening again and again. Uh, at least from 2014, we have been say, uh, saying, uh, seeing that uh, on a great scale uh, in India, that they say, we are uh, today they say we have passed a bill in order to help the peasants but if you really read the bills between the lines you will easily find that uh, the these new laws are meant to betray the peasants to sell them over to the corporates to make them the slaves of the rich corporates so that uh, they produce only for them and the corporates will ultimately decide the prices. Uh, they will have monopoly over grains and over other uh, agricultural products uh, and they will make profits while uh, the prices uh, for the common people of all the agricultural produce uh, will go up. So that is only one example. So it's the same thing. Uh, you make an environmental law. And you say it is you are going to protect the environment, while actually you may be trying to destroy the environment. 
by giving plenty of licenses to industrialists to start an industry anywhere without environmental clearance. Or you make a forest law, uh, which ultimately will, uh, uh, you know, uh, will lead to the loss of habitat for so many tribal people who have been living in the forest and which will allow great freedom to the big corporates to come into the forest, uh, not only to destroy the forest, but even do uh, mining for copper or for iron for other kinds of ores in the, in, in the forest. And, 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 and you find also uh, various kinds of bills like uh, the uh, Citizens Amendment Act, uh, where uh, citizenship is deci uh, decided on the basis of religion. Uh, so, obviously, it looks like, uh, you know, they want all Indians to have a citizenship identity, a citizenship and an identity. But you will know that behind that, there was another purpose of uh, keeping out people who belong to the minority religions, uh, keeping them out of uh, uh, Indian citizenship, denying them citizenship. So, like this, so this is this is what uh, George Orwell called double speak. You say something, but you mean the very opposite of what you say. I have given only some examples, but there are so many examples you get from social life. So they say they, they are giving you freedom, but they are actually trying to chain you down. They are taking away whatever freedoms you had. And so uh, this is done not only by one party, but uh, perhaps many parties. And so we should be very careful. We should be able to read between the lines. We should be able to read the unconscious in the texts that we get and to find out what they really mean and not what they say that they mean. Okay, thank you, sir. Besides creativity, poetry involves political interference. What is your opinion on this? Yes, I believe that ultimately all human beings are political beings too, as they are primarily social beings. Because even if we live as individuals, we live in communities, in societies, and even our language has been created by society. It is not something that I have invented for myself. I may, I may change the language, I may bring in new inflections to the language, I may try to give new meanings to words, but ultimately these words have been inherited by me from my predecessors. And hence, I am compelled to use that language. And when I use that language, consciously or unconsciously, I am in some sense invoking all my predecessors who have used these words and all those poets who have given different shades of meaning to those words. In that sense, I think no poet can completely avoid being social. And being social to me also means being political, which means not being a member of the party, but taking positions, taking positions regarding class, regarding caste, regarding gender, and regarding almost all the major issues that trouble human beings. Because after all, a poet is one human being among several human beings, and he or she cannot avoid addressing these questions in one way or the other. The only difference is that the poet addresses these questions in the poet's own way, and not, not in, the, uh, in the way a novelist does not in the way a theorist or an intellectual or an activist does, but in the way a poet does. That is, aesthetically, uh, by using language in very novel ways, by giving new and subtle meanings to each word and each context, and making even the silences within the poem speak. So, uh, that is how poet is related to politics and the poet also tries to express politics in his or her own way. So there is no way that you can avoid being political. And, and those who say they are apolitical, they don't have politics, even are expressing a kind of politics. They are saying that I am not interested in society, I am not interested in politics, and that itself is a kind of politics, uh, a politics of indifference to society, a politics of indifference to the major issues that uh, the human species, as a species, and human beings within their communities 
face today. Uh, to avoid the speaking anything about those major challenges that people face. So ultimately, I believe every poet uh, is political in some way or other, either by being silent about issues or by speaking about issues. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, we are now living in an era when the communal forces are interfering in every aspect of creativity. What are the challenges that you face in these changing times? I would say that yes, unfortunately, I believe that in the recent years we have gone several centuries backward and it seems our society is being communalized very fast and all the old divisions which we had thought had disappeared seem to be coming back. And yes, as a writer, I also face uh, this issue uh, because I try to be secular, I try to uh, cultivate friendship and harmony among different religions and non-religious beliefs. And people like me are always uh, uh, hunted uh, after, we are abused, uh, we, I, 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 I very often get uh, abusive phone calls or messages on my social media. But I think uh, uh, this is something one should be ready to confront in times like this, when a culture of hatred is being deliberately cultivated in society, instead of a culture of love and culture of harmony. And so we should be very wary, very, very careful about those people who are trying to cultivate uh, hatred and divide the society on the lines of uh, religion. And hence, we have all to be aware, especially uh, young people like you, have to be aware uh, who these forces of hatred are and try to avoid them or try to confront them directly by speaking against uh, the divisions uh, of uh, um, uh, on the basis of religion, on the basis of community. Because ultimately, as Ramakrishna would say, or Vivekananda would say, or Gandhi, or Kabir, or many of the Bhakti poets and the Sufi poets like Bulesha would say, all the religions lead to the same God. They are only, the, they are only different means to attain the same God. And by God, if I can depend on Gandhi, uh, they also mean truth. So they are all different ways of understanding truth and there is no need at all for religions to quarrel or for the society to be divided on religious or communal lines. So we need to cultivate this kind of an approach. Uh, by a secular approach, I don't mean uh, giving up religions altogether. It is up to you to accept a religion or not to accept a religion or to convert from one religion to another. Uh, but ultimately, all religions and also people without religions should be able to live together in, in, in harmony. We have such a tradition, a tradition of argument, a tradition of debate, a tradition of very healthy polemics. Instead of uh, killing one another, we used to argue uh, in order to settle questions. And so we should get back to that culture of argument, debate and healthy communication and not a culture of hatred and uh, mutual abuse and even mutual murder. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir, you are famous for your political views. How far is politics important in our lives? Uh, I have partly answered this question in the very beginning. I think politics is extremely important because even if you don't, you don't believe, believe in politics, politics believes in you and politics is going to get hold of you. Even if you remain completely silent, without taking part, without taking sides, with avoiding every kind of debate, avoiding even uh, elections or uh, uh, the kinds of choices of your representatives, ultimately uh, politics is going to get you. Because it is the politicians who finally decide almost everything about your life. What you should write about, what you should speak speak about, uh, at what price you should buy things, at what price you should sell things, what kind of house you should have, what kind of amenities and uh, facilities you should have. Ultimately, it is the politicians, the parliament uh, or the, the executive and, and all those things which are, uh, which are finally decided by the politicians, which uh, are going to take the ultimate decisions about your life. And that is why politics becomes important and that's why we need to be politically aware. 
by saying this, let me repeat, I am not asking anybody to become a member of a political party or the, or the spokesman, spokesperson of a particular party. What I mean is that you have to be politically aware. You have to know what is happening in the country, what is happening in the world. You have to know that uh, if we do not care for the environment, human species is going to end and uh, we are living in a time, the time of uh, uh, COVID-19, which is trying to give us a message. In fact, the nature is trying to give us a message saying, you are not the master of the universe. The, the world is shared by so many beings, plants and trees and animals. And man is only a small part of this universe. And human history is only a very humble and modest chapter in the history of human beings, in the, in the, in the history of uh, beings and in the history of the earth. And, uh, and only perhaps one word or one sentence in the larger history of the whole universe. So politics does not mean party politics. It can mean the politics of environment, the politics of class, the politics of caste, the politics of gender and the politics of uh, what I call everyday life. So in some sense, one cannot avoid politics and avoiding politics may only lead you uh, uh, into darkness, uh, into a complete and uh, being completely unconscious about what is happening in the country. And only when you become the victim, you will know that, well, uh, it was wrong not to have taken positions. You know, uh, uh, it is often said that, okay, you kept silent when that was happening. You kept silent when this was happening. And finally, uh, when your brother was killed, you did not speak. Your sister was killed, you did not speak. Finally, they come to kill you. You suddenly realize, oh, I should have spoken for them. Then they would have been alive to speak for me. So politics is so necessary for understanding the world and for ultimately our own survival as individuals, as societies, and even as a species. Thank you so much. Stammer is no handicap. It is a mode of speech. Stammer is the silence that falls between the word and its meaning.